Working in confined spaces can be deadly. Many people have been killed or seriously injured while working in confined spaces. According to the national statistics, Workplace Safety and Health 2008, 10% of workplace fatalities were due to work-related accidents in confined spaces. A confined space is any enclosed area in which dangerous gases, vapors or fumes are likely to be present or the supply of air is inadequate or there is a risk of engulfment. Some common examples of confined spaces include manholes, barge tanks, ISO tanks, boreholes, silos, reactors. Working in confined space can be hazardous if proper safety measures are not in place. Some of the more common hazards faced by personnel working in confined spaces are oxygen deficiency, the required oxygen concentration for safe entry into confined space is 19.5% to 23.5%. Lower oxygen concentration may result in difficulty in breathing, headache, unconsciousness, or even death. Fire and explosion. Accumulation of flammable gases and vapors may lead to fire or even an explosion in the confined space. Poisoning. The presence of toxic gases, vapors or fumes can also harm the health of workers in the confined spaces, leading to death. A marine surveying company was engaged to inspect a barge berthed at a shipyard. On day one, the surveyor arrived at the shipyard. He met with the maintenance superintendent who represented the barge owner and the captain of the barge's tugboat. Together, they boarded the barge. The surveyor realized that the manholes to the barge tanks were closed. As the tanks were not ventilated, the surveyor asked for the manholes to be opened and that he would be back for inspection the next day. The surveyor then left the barge. On the next morning, the manholes were opened. At 9.45 a.m., the surveyor arrived and met with the superintendent. After a short discussion, he left to look for the captain, who was supposed to accompany him on the inspection. Meanwhile, it started to rain. At 10.15 a.m., the superintendent received a call from the captain informing him that the surveyor had not met with him. The captain soon arrived at the security post. After a while, the rain stopped. A crew was mobilized to search for the missing surveyor. It was 11 a.m. During the search, the crew suspected that the missing surveyor might be inside one of the barge's tanks. The search for the surveyor in the tanks began. It was noon. A gas test was conducted before the worker entered the manhole of a tank. The oxygen level in the tank was only 10%. A breathing apparatus would be needed to enter the tank. As no functioning breathing apparatuses were available, a helmet used for blasting operations was used instead. The worker then entered the manhole and caught a glimpse of the surveyor. It was 1.15 p.m. Subsequently, rescue personnel with proper breathing apparatuses managed to reach the surveyor. However, the surveyor had already stopped breathing. By the time SEDF personnel arrived and retrieved his body, it was 2.30 p.m. A simple surveying job resulted in the loss of a life. What went wrong? Insufficient planning, preparation and communication. The maintenance superintendent and captain were not aware that the surveyor needed to enter the tanks. No preparations were made prior to the inspection. The manholes were only opened on the second morning which resulted in not having enough time to ventilate the tanks. Entry procedures not followed. An entry permit was not applied and gas tests were not conducted. Because the surveyor entered the barge tank without an entry permit, he violated safety rules and placed his life in danger. Although the surveyor was supposed to be accompanied by the captain, he proceeded with the inspection alone. Lack of emergency procedures. 
the shipyard did not have a proper emergency plan for the rescue of people in the confined space. Rescue equipment was also not readily available. It took more than an hour for the rescue personnel to reach the surveyor after locating his position. Lessons learned. Risk assessment. Before starting work in a confined space, always conduct a risk assessment to identify safety and health hazards. Measures to minimize risks should have been implemented. Warning signs. Warning signs must be displayed at every entry point of a confined space to warn against unauthorized entry. Entry permit. Ensure that the entry permit is valid before entering a confined space. Throughout work in the confined space, check again that the permit is valid and has been correctly endorsed. Confined space attendant. When work is carried out in a confined space, a confined space attendant should be stationed outside the confined space to keep a lookout. In the event of an emergency, the attendant must not enter the confined space. Instead, he should raise the alarm and activate the emergency rescue plan. Proper emergency plan. All premises where confined space work is carried out must institute a proper emergency plan. This plan should include easy access to rescue equipment and trained rescue personnel. No one should enter or work in a confined space without a valid entry permit. A valid confined space permit must clearly indicate the following. Identification and location of the confined space. Purpose of entry. Date, time and validity duration. Potential hazards identified and the control measures put in place. Confined space attendant. Ventilation and lighting arrangement and results of atmospheric testing. The permits must also be endorsed by the supervisor, confined space assessor and authorized manager. The supervisor will apply for the confined space entry permit. After filling up the entry permit, a safety assessor will accompany him to inspect the confined space and to conduct a gas test. The results are recorded and then sent to the authorized manager. Once the authorized manager is satisfied that the confined space is safe and appropriate control measures are in place, he will approve and issue the permit. Before work commences, a copy of the endorsed entry permit must be clearly displayed at the entrance of the confined space. Most toxic or flammable gases and oxygen deficiency cannot be easily detected. So, it's important to test the atmosphere of a confined space and ensure that it is safe for entry. All the results of the gas test are to be recorded and attached to the entry permit. In a typical gas test, test for oxygen levels first. The acceptable range of oxygen concentration for safe entry into confined space is between 19.5% and 23.5%. Next, test for the presence of flammable gases or vapors. Concentrations should not exceed 10% of the lower explosive limits. Finally, test for toxic gases, vapors and volatile organic compound to ensure that their concentrations are below their permissible exposure levels. There are various types of gas detection instruments. It is important that you select a suitable gas detection instrument by assessing the possible atmospheric hazards present. Calibrate the instrument and understand how the selected instrument is used. As different gases accumulate at different levels or locations, gas tests should be done at various depths. At least one person in a group working in the same vicinity should be equipped with a portable gas detector to monitor the atmosphere continuously. Periodic gas tests should also be conducted. Always strive to achieve a safe environment for workers to breathe and work in.
However, there are times when the desired safe working environment cannot be achieved or entry is required for rescue purposes. When this occurs, respiratory protective equipment must be provided. These equipment will allow workers to breathe safely in an oxygen deficient or toxic environment. There are two common types of respiratory protective equipment supplied air respirators and air purifying respirators. Supplied air respirators are used when there is a lack of oxygen or a high concentration of contaminants. Examples include self contained breathing apparatuses and airline respirators. Air purifying respirators is a filtration system that cleans the air that is being inhaled. They are less bulky and easier to use. However, they cannot be used in oxygen deficient atmospheres, poorly ventilated confined spaces, areas where concentrations of toxic contaminants are unknown, areas immediately dangerous to life or health, or areas where the concentration of a contaminant is higher than the maximum permissible concentration and or filter class capacities. Some other personal protective equipment include protective clothing, safety helmets, eye protection, hearing protection, gloves, safety boots, and safety harnesses. For confined space works, a confined space attendant shall be appointed. The attendant should remain outside the confined space to monitor the people entering and working in the confined space, maintain contact with people in the confined space, and activate the emergency rescue plan in the event of an emergency. An effective rescue plan should consist of Name of designated rescue personnel, methods of rescue, type and availability of rescue equipment, effective means to summon the rescue personnel. Conduct regular rescue drill practice. Rushing into a confined space without proper preparation or equipment can endanger your life. Remember, an unplanned rescue will probably be your last.